Evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Manny Menchel. I'm here tonight representing the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington, where I serve as Chief Impact Officer. It's my honor to welcome you to our first session of the Israel 75 virtual book series, co-sponsored by the Jewish Federation and Moment Magazine as part of Federation's ongoing Israel 75 initiative. Federation is proud to partner with incredible institutions like Moment as we mark this milestone year honoring Israel's independence and offering the community unique opportunities to engage with thought-provoking platforms during these complex times. Tonight, I'm pleased to introduce our Israel at 75 virtual, virtual book series with a uniquely powerful dialogue. We'll dive in to the unparalleled poetry of Yehuda Amichai Zecher Levracha, the great author and poet, with the esteemed scholar and commentator, Dr. Robert Alter. Personally, I first connected with Professor Alter's work on Psalms and the wisdom books, and I've so enjoyed bringing his recent translation on the commenta and commentary on the Bible to synagogue with me in the morning. Our session will be led by Amy E. Schwartz, Moment Magazine's opinion and book editor, as well as editor of the magazine's popular Ask the Rabbis section. Before coming to Moment, Amy was a longtime editorial writer and op-ed columnist at the Washington Post covering education, science and culture, and where she was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in commentary. Please join me in welcoming Amy. Thank you very much, and welcome all of you to the Federation Moment uh, book, club, book, uh, book series um, honoring Israel at 75. We are so delighted to have the distinguished um, Robert Alter with us to, to kick this off. Let me start by introducing him. Um, Robert Alter is professor of the Graduate School and Emeritus Professor of Hebrew and Comparative Literature at the University of California at Berkeley where he has taught since 1967. He is, as you just heard, a, a, an award-winning scholar, critic, and of course, translator. Um, it's probably easiest to say he's won every imaginable award, but I'll, I'll give you a few. Um, he is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the Council of Scholars of the Library of Congress, and past president of the Association of Literary Scholars and Critics. He's been a Guggenheim Fellow, a National Endowment for the Humanities um, Fellow, a Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Jerusalem, and an Old Dominion Fellow at Princeton. He has written widely on the European novel, on American fiction, and on modern Hebrew literature. And of course, as is, is well known, he has also written extensively on literary aspects of the Bible. Uh, among his 28 published books are um, prize-winning volumes on biblical narrative and poetry. I too uh, grew up with these from from uh, from my or from you know from my college education onward, um, and uh, award-winning translations of Genesis and of course of the five books of Moses. Um, he has also devoted book-length studies to Fielding, Stendhal, Nabokov, and the self-reflexive tradition in the novel. So many many different um, aspects of literature. His completed translation of the Hebrew Bible with commentary was published in 2018 in a three volume set. In, 20, in 2009, he received the Robert Kirsch Award from the Los Angeles Times for lifetime contributions to American letters. And in 2013, the Charles Homer Haskins Prize for career achievement from the American Council of Learned Societies. He has honorary degrees from Yale, Northwestern, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and other institutions. Um, so, Welcome, welcome, Dr. Alter. It's it's just it's a delight to talk to you um, about, um, and I know that you've you've done a lot of, of work on Amachai, including um, edited uh, book of translations, which we have available for um, for purchase. Um, let me start um, by asking you to talk a little bit about Yehuda Amachai generally. Uh, before we look at the three poems you've selected to sort of introduce us in a more granular way. We're kicking off with this event where um, we're, we're kicking off a series, Israel at 75, through its poets and novelists, dedicated to the sort of, I guess, obvious proposition 
that um, there are things we can understand about Israel now or just generally through poets and through its creative artists that we can't understand any other way. Now, Amichai is, I know you want to emphasize this, um, a poet of international importance, quite aside from his identity as an Israeli writer. And a lot of his finest work is personal and not in any sense national or political. But it's also true that he's Israel's kind of national poet. He encapsulates aspects of the national experience in his life. And some of his poems um, have achieved almost liturgical status in the state. They're read at memorial services, things like that. So I wonder, can you lead us in by talking a little bit about this double aspect of Amichai? How can we best approach him? Well, as I said, he is, first of all, a very personal poet. And I think, by the way, I should say to your viewers that, that uh, he was a dear personal friend. So uh, I have a, a good sense of the man. And I think he would not have been comfortable with the label Israel's national poet, even though some people started applying that label even in his lifetime. Um, he also probably would have been quizzical about the fact that, that as I, I'm also well aware, um, some of his poems have been adopted for liturgical use. Now, he grew up in an Orthodox home in Germany, um, uh, a modern Orthodox home. Uh, he fled uh, with his parents from Germany in 1936, when he was 12 year, years old, to Israel. Uh, he, um, since he had gone to a Hebrew day school, he actually had a pretty good grasp of the, um, the language when he came. Uh, of course, it wasn't Israel, it was pre-state Palestine. Um, he um, broke with orthodoxy. It wasn't a crisis of faith. He once said to me, well, uh, I just sort of got bored with all the, the repetitions in Shul. <laughs> so <laughs> so but by the time he finished high school, and he, he was sent to uh, a, a Mamnachti Dati, a, a um, national religious uh, a high school in, in Israel, um, he, he dropped the religion, but he remained deeply tied to it. Uh, and you can see that uh, in a lot of the poems, but he was always wrestling with, with the, the traditional concepts. Uh, and we'll see that in one of the three poems I've selected to, to look at. So for that reason, I think he would have been a, a little puzzled or maybe taken aback with, with the fact that, that some of his poems have become part of the liturgy. Well, you mention you mentioned this, and um, I'm sure you'll we'll come back to it in detail. Um, but I just wanted to pick up on one one allusion, and you, you talk about how he was familiar already with the language and the liturgy. And one of the things that's often said about Amichai's Hebrew poet, his poetry in the original, is the way it's constantly shifting registers. That he he uses the biblical Hebrew and you know, the liturgical Hebrew and contemporary language, and he's always um, using that. So let, let's, uh, I, I want to ask you um, if you could talk a little bit about what it's like to translate somebody like that, you know, and, and you know, what, what, uh, what, what's, the, what's been your, what was your experience wrestling with, with all these, these different approaches? And I guess I also, I'm curious, what's it like to translate such a close friend? Well, uh, translating a, a close friend who's also a great poet. And, and I should say, by the way, I think he was clearly the greatest Hebrew poet of the second half of the 20th century. And in my view, one of the half dozen great poets 
in any language for that time period. Uh, he certainly ought to have gotten the, the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, I think for political reasons, especially because of Israel hanging on to the territories, the people in Stockholm were never going to give it to him, but he certainly uh, deserved it. So um, the challenge of translating him really differed from poem to poem. That, that is, th there are poems that are straight colloquial, uh, and uh, they, and by the way, I should say this, the generation of Hebrew poets before Amichai, uh, of whom the most prominent was probably Natan Altaman, wrote a very fancy, intricate Hebrew, which was very literary. And uh, uh, Yehud Amichai was part of a small group, and he was certainly the leading figure in that group called the Krat, uh, that effected a revolution in the language of Hebrew poetry, moving into the colloquial. So there's some poems that are colloquial from beginning to end, uh, and uh, you can get those in English very well. But re um, English readers are, are lab labor under the misapprehension that he's altogether uh, a so-called vernacular poet. And as you said in your question, that's not quite true. Um, he plays around a lot with biblical allusions. Uh, uh, as you indicated, there's the language of the liturgy, and we'll see a, an example of that. And then altogether, he taps some of the distinctive resources of the Hebrew language that do not exist in any other language. For example, there is a, a totally untranslatable sonnet called uh, Sonet Binyanim, uh, which would literally translate would be the sonnet of the verb conjugations. That is, there are seven conjugations of verbs, Binyanim, that everybody learns in school. And uh, what he did, and it goes from kal, which means simple, to usually the last one in order is hitpael, which is reflexive. So what he did was to make a haunting ages of man uh, poem out of these seven verb conjugations. In other words, it begins with kal, the little kid crawling around on the floor, and it ends with, with Hitpael reflexive, where the aged person close to death turns back in on himself and is reflexive. So you can see how brilliant it is, but there's no way to get that a, in another language. Did you translate that one? Or just no, I wouldn't that? try to. <laughs> Sounds, yeah. Sounds impossible. Translation has its limits. Right. Well, on that on that note of perhaps unnecessary humility, uh, let me hand it over to you. I'll I'll I just let's let's look at let's look at the poems you you've chosen. I won't break in unless I'm absolutely can't um, can't contain myself. Okay, and we're going to be sharing the screen, right? Yes. Let's have let's have the first uh, poem on the screen, please. Perfect. Um, okay, th this is from his first volume of poetry. And um, I'm going to, in each case, uh, I will read the poem and then make a few comments about it. I waited for my girl and her steps were not there, but I heard a shot. Soldiers training for war. Soldiers always train for some war. Then I opened the collar of my shirt and the two lapel edges pointed in two directions, and my neck rose between them, on it the crest of my quiet head bearing the fruit of eyes. And below, in my warm pocket, the clinking keys gave me the small sense of security of those things that could still 
be locked and kept. But my girl yet walks through the streets adorned in the jewels of the end time and the beads of the terrible danger round her neck. Well, he wrote a number of poems in, in this vein. I think this is a very haunting poem, which juxtaposes two realms, as um, many of his early poems do. Now, the, uh, the I don't know exactly when this poem was written, whether it was actually written during 1948-49 uh, or uh, sometime soon afterwards. It came out in a volume in the early 1950s. Um, Yudha Michai uh, served in, in uh, the Palmach, the, the, uh, the uh, commando unit uh, of the um, Israeli army and saw some really harsh combat on the um, front, the Egyptian front, the front in, in the Negev. Uh, a, a friend of his in the army was like an older brother to him, was named Dicky was um, shot, fatally wounded, and Yehuda carried his bleeding body back and Dickie died. Uh, and this is something that haunted him all his life and, and he recurs to it in a number of the, the poems. So war is a very grim experience, but at the same time, and this is what really had terrific resonance in Israel, although I think readers outside of Israel can understand that resonance. Uh, while the, the speaker of these poems is called on to go to the battlefront to put his life uh, on the line, he desperately wants to cling to some precious semblance of private life and of love. And you can see this uh, expressed very vividly in this poem. Now, uh, about the, um, uh, uh, the language of the poem, it is uh, de definitely colloquial. This is the, the, the new vernacular poetry uh, which he uh, pioneered. But it's not 100% colloquial. For example, the first line is, uh, the first phrase is, Chikiti lenarati, I waited for my girl. Now, nobody called in Israel calls his girlfriend Narati or Hanarashali. You say, uh, And uh, so even in a colloquial poem, there are certain adaptations, modifications of the language that are made in the direction uh, of a, um, a more uh, literary diction. Uh, also note the unusual formulation of her steps were not there. That, that is, uh, he doesn't say she was not there or she had not yet come, but he's waiting maybe on a street corner, somewhere in Jerusalem, no doubt, where he lived. Uh, he's waiting to hear her steps coming down the street and her steps were not there. But instead of her steps are the these shots of soldiers training for war. Then we, we have a, a kind of, a uh, bizarre description of himself and what he's wearing. Uh, and uh, that stands in uh, contrast to the soldiers and the, their shots. Uh, and by the way, uh, imagery, maybe we will see this better in a, another one of the poems, it is one of the strikingly event, inventive aspects of Amichai's poetry. So he's, he has a, this strange perception of the lapels uh, of his shirts pointing in two different directions. 
which they do, they did, and then his neck r rises between them like some kind of plant or tree. Uh, I, I suppose more more a tree than a plant, and his head is quiet, and it bears the fruit of eyes, which is odd and arresting. But notice how, how this kind of idyllic imagery, the fruit, the, 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 the tree, the quiet head, stand in contrast to uh, the shots of, of the training soldiers. And then he literally hangs on to something of his private existence. He puts his hand in his pocket and the, the keys to, to where he lives, uh, he feels with his hand uh, and uh, they uh, give him the sense of security or something that, that could still be locked and kept. In other words, a private realm uh, in which to which you can retreat, you're not being called on maneuvers, you're not being called up to the front or on reserve duty. This is my private world that I cherish. And then at the end, uh, as a kind of companion to that first stanza, but his my girl yet walked through the streets adorned in the jewels of the end time, which that, that little flourish, I, I think, is pure Ami Chai. It's only two words in the Hebrew, Tachshite Haketz. And one of the poetic advantages of the Hebrew language is you can take a simple monosyllabic word like Ketz, end, uh, but put in this context, it clearly means something like the end of days, Ketz Ayamim. And uh, uh, he's worried about her. The whole world is dangerous. Shots are flying around. The world is at war. The beads of the terrible danger round her neck instead of uh, 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 semi-precious jewels in a necklace. So you, you can see this is the kind of poem in his early vol two volumes that really grabbed the attention of the Israeli reading public and they could identify with this because they too wanted to cling to a precious private realm, to a realm of love in the midst of being called to war. Okay, let's go to uh, the the next poem, which is um, "But We Must Praise." Now, I had a request from the from the chat to if you have the title of the poems in Hebrew, would you would you give us those too? Okay, the 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 first poem is "Chikiti Lenarati." The second poem is "Aval Aval Alenu Lishabeach." Now. Translators always cheat in one way or another, and I cheated here. That is, any Hebrew reader, even one who, who rarely sets foot in a religious service, would immediately pick up Aleinu Shabeach as the opening words of the, the closing prayer in synagogue. Uh, an English reader would not recognize that at all, that at all. So uh, I put it in a, as an epithet, the, um, I'm sorry, as an epigraph. The, the, the Hebrew poem does not have an epigraph. So let me read it. But we must praise a familiar night, gold borrowed from the abyss, cypresses rose forever. Far away, Long hair still flows, Lord of the loss of all. What are you doing to me, far away woman? You hung me as on branches with weeping thoughts. From far away, your hand touches me as if testing my bridges. They bear the weight and tremble. Yours 
is the kingdom. Behind my words, dark as the moon, come to me, make me tired. But we must praise the loins of all your lap, shout of the shoulder that bore you to me on the night of reversal, stars of forgetful man above us, your body's style, sky's manner here in the hollow of this narrow world. But we must. Okay, so the poem begins with a tiny snippet from the liturgy. We must praise, Alain el Shaber. Before that, however, is the word but. So that already sets up a certain tension between the Alenu of the liturgy and the uh, Alenu of Amichai's poem, because something different is going to happen. Now, the, um, he goes on with, with a, a play of words, which I, I a, a sound play, which I could not really uh, uh, duplicate in, in uh, the translation. Gold borrowed from the abyss, which is Zahav Moshal Misha'ol which is also much more compact and much more rhythmic th than the English. That is, the word for borrowed is moshal. The word for the abyss, the, 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 uh, uh, the realm of death, really, is sheol. It's a very biblical word. And another instance, together with, with the um, liturgical citation, that the poem is not strictly modern colloquial because um, nobody would say Sha'ol in conversation. You wouldn't say that, that uh, Abba Shali Yarad le Sha'ol at Mol, that my father went down to Sha'ol. You would say, you know, my father died or my father passed away. Uh, Avi met, uh, uh, Abba Shali Niftar, something like that. Cyprus is rose forever. Far away, long hair still flows. That is, I think the far away, which is repeated three times, is an indication that the beloved woman is at a distance from him, but is coming to him. Now, I'd like to go back to the Lord of the Loss of All, which I think is quite brilliant and shows how creatively uh, Amichai plays with the Hebrew language. So let's go back to the, the text of the liturgy. The text begins like this. Aleinu l'shabeach la'adon hakol. We must praise the Lord of all. So what does he do? He breaks off the object of praise and substitutes a familiar night, and then he finally brings in Adon, Lord, from the liturgy in the last line of the stanza and um, makes it into something quite different from what it is in the traditional uh, prayer. Lord of the loss of all, which is beautifully alliterative in the Hebrew. Adon of Dan Akol, with uh, the Aleph of Adon being followed by the, uh, the uh, uh, Aleph of, of Dan, loss. Now, how does loss get into it? Well, th this anticipates something that we will see uh, in a moment uh, when we go on to the third poem that, that I've chosen. That is, Amichai is a great love poet. And this poem is a poem about the rapture of love. But more often than not, his love poems are poems about uh, what is uh, lost when love is over. About the, the it is the, the um, Separation of lovers, 
the parting of lovers that grabs him emotionally. Now that's not always true. For example, when he first got to, to together with, with uh, Hanna Sokolov, who became the woman of his life, and uh, they lived together t till his death. Um, he wrote, they, they spent a, a little vacation time uh, at uh, the, the beach at Achsiv, a, a little location just a bit south of Haifa. And those poems are simply <laughs> uh, uh, ecstatically erotic poems. They're a, a celebration of, of the, the joy of, of carnal union. Uh, and that's here in this, or intimated in this poem. But this, so where does the, the, the loss come? Well, let's look back at the second line. Gold borrowed from the abyss. That is the abyss, Sha'ol, swallows up everything. The nature of human existence is that all fulfillment is transient. And so when you have a night of love, it is gold borrowed from the abyss. The, the abyss gives you a little waiting time to enjoy, and then it swallows up what you've been enjoying. Um, so the, the, the second stanza, again, you see the, the, the far away, she's a far away woman, and from far away your hand touches me as if testing my bridges, which is wonderful that she's now approached him. She stretches forth her hand and maybe touches his cheek or whatever. As if, and then you you have the uh, uh, characteristic Amichai turn in the simile, the which is um, from the the moment of loving touch, or in the moment of loving touch, he imagines she's testing my bridges; they bear the weight and tremble. Uh, now there's one lover touches the other. Is so saying, is he all right with all this? Is this going to, to work? But he puts it in terms of an engineering simile. That is, uh, you test the bridges to see if they can bear the weight of these heavy trucks that, that are passing over them. But they bear the weight and tremble. Well, okay, uh, a, um, a weight-bearing bridge might tremble as the truck rope rolls over it, but he's also trembling with excitement uh, at the, the uh, uh, imminent fulfillment of love. And then yours is the kingdom goes back to the language of the, the liturgical um, uh, aval, uh, uh, without the aval, aleinu l'shabeach. But it's not God who is the kingdom, but hers is the kingdom. Behind my words, dark as a moon, come to me, make me tired. So uh, the, the, the make me tired, I think, is clearly an allusion to sex. Uh, but we must praise, up above it was praising the familiar night, the loins of all, your lap. Uh, that that is again the the clear reference is sexual, uh, and somehow, for the moment, we move from the Lord of the Lost of All to the Loins of All. She becomes a kind of cosmic presence. That that, that is, her lap is the whole world, uh, and then there's a kind of fragmentary image of bear, being born to her on the night of reversal, whatever that is. And then your body style, sky's manner here in the hollow of this narrow world, but we must. And uh, the, um, uh, the sense is that 
the world is a, a narrow confinement. It, it's a um, hollow, a kuf in the Hebrew. Um, but somehow or other, uh, her body, her love, give you a sense of the sky, give you a sense of the, the heavenly world above. Okay, I'd like to now, I think I have time for just one more poem. You have you have time. Can I ask you one quick question before we sure. go on? Um, where, where, you know, you're, we, we must praise the loins of all. How did you manage that pun? I mean, I mean, not, I guess pun isn't the right word, but it must be as as much an echo in the Hebrew as it is in the English. But that's really a translation. Uh, um, that's a that's a fabulous solution to what must be something of a problem. Yeah, well, uh, I know sometimes things just work in a translation. But I'll tell you, you, your body's style gave me no end of grief. This is a literal rendering of the Hebrew, signon gufech. But um, that didn't sound right to me. It sounded a little weird. So in my first draft, I had your body's chic. And then uh, my wife, who was a very good judge of poetry. No, you can't do that. So for about two weeks, I walked around. Sometimes you do this translating, thinking of alternatives for the Hebrew signon. Uh, and different friends suggested di different possibilities. None of them seemed to work. And so uh, after two weeks, I said, OK, I give up. I'm going back to the original rendering and just saying your body's style. It's not perfect, but it sort of works. Yes, okay, doesn't. let's go to the last poem. Now, okay, here is an instance of non colloquial Hebrew and Amichai doing certain radical things with the Hebrew language. That is, we all know that, that the, the ordinary way you say both hello and goodbye in Hebrew is shalom, but he doesn't say that here. He says, hayi shalom, which is very formal, very literary. And of course, uh, because uh, all verbs are conjugated according to gender in Hebrew, uh, you, the reader knows right away that he's addressing a woman. Okay, I'll, it's, it's short enough that I can read, read it through quickly and then I'll comment. Farewell, O oh face of you, already face of memory. Parting ascends a ghost and flies and flies. Face of beasts, face of water, face of going. And grove of whispers, face of lap, face of child. Not ours again the hour when we could touch not ours to say, yes now, yes now. A name of winds was yours once, woman of directions and intentions, mirror and fall. For what we did not grasp, we sang together, ages in darkness, face of alternation, no longer mine, now undeciphered, block nipples, buckles, mouths and screws. And so farewell, forever sleepless, for all came through our word, a profane all. For now you weave your own dreams, world and all. Farewell, death's bundles and suitcases, threads, feathers, dwellings, tangle, token of hair, for that which will not, will not be, no hand can write, and what was not the body's we forget. Now, I should have said this about, um, but we must praise. That poem and this one are written in rhyme. He did a lot of rhyming poems, including sonnets and quatrains in the early phase of his career. And I have to say that um, translating in rhymes is beyond me. I mean, I could think up rhymes, but any rhymes that I could think of would lead me to distort somewhat what is saying, what is being said in the Hebrew. And I find that that almost all the uh, rhyme translations of Amichai's poetry 
do that and are not satisfactory. The, the person who comes closest is my late Berkeley friend, um, Hannah Bloch, who was a fine poet and a very skilled translator. And here and there, uh, Stephen Mitchell also succeeds, but mostly it doesn't work. So what I've done in place of rhyme is to try to make the lines as rhythmic as possible, possible. For what we did not grasp, we sang together. That, and there are many lines like that. Okay. Farewell, O face of you. Well, what's going on? Well, he does something that you can't do in Hebrew. He says, Hayi shalom pneat. Now, the way you say uh, your face in Hebrew, speaking to a, a female, is panayich. Uh, that is, it's a, the word panim with a... a female possessive singular suffix. Or in speech, he would say hapanim shalach. But he doesn't do that. He uh, uses what is never done, uh, the pane um, uh, face of, and then in the construct state, face of what? At. The, the uh, feminine singular personal pronoun, which you can't do, but he does it. But why does he do it? He does it because everything is breaking up. Even the language is breaking up. So instead of the, expect, the expected panayich, you have pneat, which jolts you as a Hebrew reader. Uh, and there's, I, I substituted in English the, the rather odd O face of you. Um, and then we, and he continues with this, with, with face of beast, face of going, it's all face of lap. It's all rather mysterious, but what you feel is that the, um, his world is breaking to pieces in the midst of memory of the love that he had for her. Um, and then the memory comes back in a, a more coherent Hebrew in the first two lines of the next stanza. Not ours again, the hour when we could touch, not ours to say, yes, now, yes, now, now, now. I'm almost sure, I hope this doesn't offend anybody, that the yes, now, the yes, now is what's called out between them at the moment of sexual climax, but that's gone now. Um, uh, okay, I'd like to, since I'm running out of the, the time allotted for discussing the poem, skip down to the last two lines of the third stanza. No longer mine, now undeciphered. Now that's an, uh, there are always surprising choices in Amichai's poems. That's one of the ways in which he's a great poet. So you don't normally talk about deciphering a woman, but now she's become like something written in code, a code that he can't break. And then in a brilliant line, block nipples, buckles, mouths, and screws. Now you see how Th those four nouns weave in and out between a body part, a sexual body part, nipples, buckles, a, 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 a hard accoutrement of the material world, mouths also associated with sex, and screws again the mechanical world. So that mixture of the bodily and the mechanical all in fragments is uh, a, a brilliant expression of the way the wholeness of the world that it was experienced in love has broken into pieces. Um, okay, let, let's just look uh, as the time runs short at the last stanza. 
farewell, I'll read it again. Farewell, deaths, bundles, and suitcases, threads, feathers, dwellings, tangle, token of hair for that which will not be, no hand can write, and what was not the bodies we forget. Okay, the, the last stanza is clearly a scene of the uh, site of parting, site S-I-T-E. That is, it's probably the apartment that they shared together, and now they've packed up everything. So you have bundles and suitcases, but death's bundles, because the, the parting forever of the lovers is a kind of death. And, and then, uh, as would happen when you um, pack up all your things, and leave a place where you've been living, there are these remnants. There are threads, feathers, dwellings tangle, token of hair. That's all that's left of what they were together. And then that, um, that haunting final line, and what was not the bodies we forget. That is, this, I suppose, is not a very Jewish traditional notion, but it's a very personal notion that the way we experience intimacy, profundity, the deepest kind of love is through the body. And uh, what was not the bodies, we forget. Okay, I think I, I've probably run on a little bit longer than I should have. We still have about 12 minutes to deal with your questions. The, uh, the timing is perfect. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, the questions are very, follow very specifically from the discussion of the poem. So I'm going to take a few of those first and then I, I'm going to, I okay, have- you're going to feed the question to me. Um, I'm going to feed the questions to you and then Great. I'm going to ask a wrap up question as a point of privilege. Yeah, don't bother with the chat. Um, so um, one, one person asks, do you think with this um, unique mixture of the, of the, uh, the sacred and the profane, do you um, think that Amachai might have been an influence on Leonard Cohen? On other poets? On yeah. Leonard Cohen. The, the, on the Leonard singer. Cohen, oh. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Sorry. It, I never thought of that, that's consumed. By the way, the sacred and the profane, I have to tell you that in, um, uh, uh, in one of the poems that I think it, it's, it's in um, the um, in no, it, it's not in. Is it in farewell? Um, yes, it is. In, in the third stanza, I should have pointed this out. Uh, and so farewell, forever sleepless, for all came through uh, uh, our word, a profane all. Every, there are about three different previous translations and they all misunderstand the Hebrew because they don't know anything about the, the world uh, of Orthodox practice in which Amichai grew up. The, the, that is, when an observant Jew, say, drinks a glass of whiskey, he says a bracha, and the bracha ends with shakol niya bidvaro, mm -hmm. that everything came about through his word. And colloquially, Orthodox Jews refer to that blessing as a shahakal, okay? Uh, so he's saying, uh, but by the way, chol, which is profane, has a synonym that it means sand, a homonym, I should say, that means sand. And all the other translators tra translated as sand, which is dead wrong. He says, I noticed that actually. <laughs> what? I noticed that when we were collecting the version, I thought, well, yeah. <laughs> well, where's, the sand? So, where's the sand go? <laughs> so every, uh, all came through our word, which echoes all came through his word and the, the, the blessing, a profane all, shakol shalchol, the, that is, we, we had our own everything, but it was 
not a sacred and everything. Okay, I wanted to get that yeah. in because that, that's, many layers, many yeah. layers there. Um, yeah. So a few questions concerned um, sort of the form of the book in particular. I, I, I the, the question of whether um, at any point you'd considered having facing page editions with the Hebrew. Um, and I, I, I feel as if there are some facing page editions of Amachai. Uh, oh, yeah. Is there well, by, he, by your hand or what, what's the... Yeah, the, what the, the, there's an economic consideration. Ah. <laughs> uh, to, to have facing pages of the pages of the Hebrew, this is a large anthology. It's, you know, uh, um, um, well over 400 pages. You'd have an 800 page book. And for our Strasser, who was not ready for that? So we came up with a compromise for each. The, the book is divided according, the sections are according to the original volumes of poetry in which those poems appeared. So for every section, I chose one poem to set at the beginning in with facing Hebrew. Mm. Okay, so so that is that is a quality. That is that is something that you get if you if you buy yeah. it, if you buy this book. That's great. That's great to know. Um, another questioner asked, um, did I mean Amachai uh, translated some of his own poems into English? Did you have any? Do you have any opinion of 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 those or anything? Well, all I can think of is he was friendly with, with the prominent English poet Ted Hughes, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Ted Hughes is a very good poet. I don't think he was as great a poet as Amichai. But in conjunction, in collaboration, they did translate uh, one slim volume uh, of Yehuda's poetry. I think it's the one that was called uh, Time, Hasman. Uh, and um, those translations, they're OK, but they're not terrific. <laughs> Uh, I, I think somebody whose native language is is English and knows the Hebrew very well can do a better job. And the same was true of Brodsky. I remember he he translated his own poems from Russian, and they just weren't quite. Yeah, right. But, yeah. Um, okay, I am going to. Um, this has been wonderful. I'm going to take a point of privilege now, and I want to ask you. Go ahead. A I want to ask you a question. I warned you about this. It's somewhat reductive of literature, which isn't really what we want. But just to pull this series together a little bit, let me ask you to muse on the question of: so, what do you think we learn about Israel from Amichai that we can't learn any other way? Well, I think if you think of that first poem, "I Waited for My Girl." and many other poems like that. And then some other poems which have been often anthologized and are famous, like um, uh, uh, um, God has pity for kindergarten kids. And then as they grow up, he has less and less pity. And finally, they're dying on, on, on the battlefield. So he gave voice in Israel to this kind of divided consciousness in, in Israeli in the Israeli psyche in 1948, 49, and, and afterwards, uh, well through certainly through the 67 and 73 wars, uh, which is uh, in that early period. I mean, Israel has changed a lot. Um, we 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 think of Israel uh, as a, a kind of site of new heroic new Jewish heroism, um, and uh, it was that in part. But Israelis really um, the young Israelis and the, the casualty figures were very high in, in the war of 48, 49, uh, felt that they were paying a heavy price for this. And in fact, the major Hebrew novel representing the War of Independence, um, uh, Har's The Days of Tziklag, is all about this. Uh, and in the fiction, also in the poetry, 
do you find a recurrence uh, of uh, the Akedah story in, in which the, the young generation feel that they are Isaac being called to sacrifice, to be sacrificed by their father. So you get all that in Amichai. Uh, I would say also you get a sense of the liveliness and the resourcefulness of the Hebrew language. That is, I don't know what the figures are now, but it certainly used to be that books of poetry, by, especially by Amichai, but by a few others by, um, of his generation, by Natan Zach, by Dalia Ravakovich, uh, by Dan Pagas, could be bestsellers. Because the poetry spoke to Israelis, to their inner life, in a way that nothing else could. And, and that, you, of course, you don't experience that in the translation, but Israelis experience that. Mm -hmm. And that echo of their religious or biblical language that they sort of maybe left behind, maybe not really, that that, that goes to the heart of it, too. I mean, that's... that's sure. Yeah. Now... The the average secular Israeli um, would not necessarily have res resonated to Amichai's use uh, of liturgy. He would have. He, he or she certainly would have recognized the, the Alenu in, in uh, the second poem that that we looked at, but a, a lot of the other. Um, uh, references would have passed him by, <laughs> and the average secular Israeli would not have gotten the the play with Shahakol, uh, which the the previous translators also uh, didn't get. Uh, but yet, I think he made them feel that their language had a, a unique expressive power that could touch deep places in them. That is, if if you read the Hebrew press, say, I, I read Haaretz every morning online, the language sounds pretty much like, pretty much like the language that you would encounter in, in the Washington Post or the New York Times, so often with English idioms literally translated into um, Hebrew. So uh, in that use of Hebrew, which is, they all read newspapers in Israel, which uh, pervades their daily life, uh, is, you might say that Hebrew is at a disadvantage, but in poetry, it has a great advantage, and it's a, a unique instrument of expression for the reader. Well, thank you so much. We promised we wouldn't go over it past eight, and my computer says it's eight. This has been a pleasure, an honor to learn with you, and thank you so much. And everyone, buy, buy his book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, there's some good poems in that book. <laughs> the ones I was actually, when you picked these three, I was thrilled because they were three that I had really never, um, really never looked at. And so all the more, all the more grateful. I thought we might either have an audience of people who've read a lot of Amichai or people who have read, you know, no Amichai at all, or yeah, as sure. probably happened somewhere in the middle. So, so this is, this is wonderful. Thank you again. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. It was a pleasure to be here. I just want to say thank you. Wow. Amy, Robert, what a rich and thought-provoking study. Uh, perhaps a peek under a hood of sorts. Um, really felt like a treat for me, uh, Dr. Alter, to encounter Amichai through your scholarly insights, your personal experiences and perspectives, and really want to thank you both for the exchange. I want to thank our viewers, our listeners, for joining us tonight. And if you enjoyed tonight's conversation as much as I did, I encourage you to pursue additional Israel 75 learning opportunities. Our next session will be Thursday, March 23rd at noon. You can join us for Suddenly, 
A Knock on the Door, Stories by Edgar Carrot. Just want to encourage everyone to, to uh, explore opportunities that the Federation and local organizations, institutions, synagogues, JCCs, restaurants, um, so many ways that we are marking Israel 75. And just really grateful to be here with you all tonight. Thank you, Moment Magazine. Thank you, Amy and Robert.